Oliver Cap, my nickname, more 100%, most of the people call me that, Bomberry. <laughs> January 9th, 1940. On the reservation, 16. Lady Willingdon Hospital at the time. It's no longer there, but that's where I was born. Six Nations, yeah. Cayuga Nation, Wolf Clan. I remember correctly, my dad played the game in the 40s and probably retired around 51 or two, but I knew about the game probably around 47, 48, when, you know, we carried a lacrosse stick. <laughs> it was, you know, next to whatever else we could do. And uh, yeah, it was uh, probably through him, him having played his lacrosse on the reservation and out of Caledonia and inter, uh, I think back then they call it an uh, intermediate league. Right. Yeah, it was intermediate league and played against different towns, Hespeler, North Peel, Woodbridge, Georgetown, teams like that. And that's pretty much, to go to a home game, I went to Caledonia, which was probably the closest arena to us, to the reservation back then. And, uh, probably when I was roughly seven or eight years old. And he was still playing then. I have no idea who made the stick I got, but it, he gave me a stick and chopped the handle off a little bit. But I, I think I remember the, the, the name inside the stick was the Logan. Oh, okay, Logan. It was a Logan stick, yep. Yeah, Martin was probably maybe a little bit before around the same time. And uh, Williams came in a little while later too. Williams. Yeah. Innes Williams. Yeah. There was, they were the three prominent ones. Yeah, yeah through, from that time that I remember right up until, well, the Joe Logan's son, Willie, who I played lacrosse with, took the, you know, took over the tradition of the Logan stick making. Right. And he just uh, kind of gave it up about three, four years ago. Let's see, well, there's, uh, I'm being married come on, this coming April. Will be my wife and I's 60th wedding anniversary. And we have, we had we, seven children. We lost the oldest fella. And there's still six surviving children, three boys, three girls. And uh, they pretty much were involved with sports yeah. in general, softball, hockey, lacrosse being the main one with the boys. Well, at the time, like say going back to 1960 when I got married, I was already involved with the game, kind of like at an organizational uh, uh, system back then. We just started, it just started to get uh, uh, organized really around 58, 59. We didn't have an arena at home on the res. We were going to Hagersville, Brantford, different places uh, to play the game. The boys, pretty much were involved with at least three different sports. The main ones being lacrosse, hockey, and softball in that order like. So you might say, most people say, uh, my kids come from a kind of a sport oriented family. We are. Uh, in general, like in, uh, other than me having a j job, my, my daily job was, <laughs> why didn't you have a hobby? Didn't you have any hobbies while you were, you know, working and then and, and going to lacrosse games? And I says, well, my hobby was lacrosse right. or sports in general. I had to, you know, the, the, the kids keep them involved, kept me involved. So, you know, and that was... Uh, kind of the trickiest part of, uh, you know, raising a family with, you know, three boys, three girls. But my wife 
I'm so, you know, I, I got to compliment her on most of the work. It was pretty much divided as far as uh, the family was concerned, being involved with sport. But she would probably have different ideas. She'd probably say three quarters of the work was done, you know, <laughs> with her. Then, uh, but we tried to divide it up, you know, so, so to speak. And uh, it's kind of like how we spent summers, fall, winters. It, it, it to the total year was taken up by, uh, like I said, uh, with our family being involved with the, with the, with different with the different sports that we that were available to us at, at the time. A structural iron worker, and that's uh, when I first started. I spent two years in high school, and. It was almost like I went in the front door and out the back door, so to speak. I spent two years in high school, and I says, I, you know, that's kind of enough for me. Yeah. It was kind of difficult for my dad to be, sort of keep me there. Yeah. As there was, he had a, we had a big, I come from a big family, nine of us actually, and to keep, and I was the first one that went to high school. And uh, things were getting difficult, you know, for him, I, th I believe, at that time, so I, I just cut myself loose of the high school education bit and went to work. He wanted me to work in a, the dump power plant in Caledonia where they make wallboard and all that stuff. Yeah. And I says, no, I'm not gonna work in a dusty place like that. And I'd rather be out in the open air someplace. And so that's eventually I had one of my, well, my older brother was already involved a year prior to me getting involved with this structural steel business, that trade. So I kind of followed in his tracks a year behind him, a year or so behind him, and that was in 1957. I, had, I got my union book, my apprentice union book, and I haven't looked back since. Since that time, I, well, if you can do the math, my union book is to be 60 some years old. I just got my 60 year pin a couple of years ago. And that's the trade I more or less did 99% of my working years. Oh, that's been a few of them. The Skyway Bridge is up the road here. Really? And the Lewiston Queenston Bridge, yeah. two years there. Grand Island Bridge, South Grand Island Bridge. And different places in, like in Buffalo, Detroit, uh, Syracuse, Rochester, you know, in the state, on the state side. Yeah. And most, mostly structural steel work, mainly were like when I was younger. That most, most of the guys that spent most of their younger years working on structural steel and that. Yeah. And it wasn't until my, got to be in my 40s and that, and I said, I better start thinking about getting out of the bad weather and rain and snow and, you know, the, uh, kind of weatherize myself to that point and look for inside jobs. And then that sort of turned my trade over, say, to the mechanical side of the iron working business, the structural steel business. Went, uh, I went from being outside all the time and freezing my butt in the wintertime and sweating my butt off in the summertime. So but it was all, it was all a, a good time for me. I liked my job. I liked my job and uh, I've been a foreman a couple of times, you know, throughout my career. And uh, it, uh, after all, all those years, I look back on it and I just wonder those. I know the, the next question you might ask me is, is, well, were you ever injured working on a job and that? It might be, but Yes, I've had, I'll answer that before you ask me, and yes, I've had some difficult days, so to speak, and uh, everything come out all right. Uh, hopefully, you know, I, I still got all my fingers, and there's a lot of guys in my trade that were, you know, minus things like that, and with, you know, uh, accidents. 
So I kind of, I kind of uh, lucky in a way that you might say, or safety was something that was in the back of my head, and you thought about it, but after a while, but off the start when I was younger, it, it didn't occur to me that's what that should be one number one on my mind, but it didn't until say maybe the last 20 years of my career where they start pushing safety, safety first, safety first, safety first. So it's good for the guys that are all coming up through the trade now. Yeah, it's, uh, I enjoyed it. A little bit of lacrosse, not that much. Maybe to limit things that were kind of uh, severe was three teeth, one, one season, you know, it happened. Um, cuts above the eyes, one thing, another, and other than that, and maybe a bad knee. Well, the knee didn't, and the knee hurt at the time for maybe a month or so, and, but in later years, it became something that was the result of that early injury. Yeah. But, and then to, to compare it to my work, my trade, I would think I had a, a little more hurt, <laughs> you know, in the game, okay. really. Yeah. Uh, only one time maybe in, in my career I got I got uh, hurt on the accident up in the Sault Ste. Marie. That was with a faulty tool that I was using, and I cut the back of my hand. It put me out for about three or four months of the year. So that was about the extent of that, really. That's what I said. I can pat myself on the back for some of the things that could have happened. And now that I'm older, I look back on it, and I just, oh, damn it. But you, you <laughs> sometimes I think you're, you know, I'm glad you're here. You know, so and so, you know. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit touch and go here and there, you know. But survived anyways. I would think seventy-five percent of them. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yes. It, it, the one year that I played through the '60s. When we won, I think we won the President's Cup in Brantford with the Warriors. I think about 60% of us were iron workers huh. that played on that team. For, uh, well, actually, I had a name, the guy that at that then, that, that was kind of our sponsor that then was Fred Conradi from St. Catharines here. Yeah. Well, he was for three, four, three, four years, if I remember correctly. And uh, guys that, played on that team were either from home or a few from Tuscarora. We had a couple guys from St. Catharines here too. But through those 60s, right up until the early 70s, most of the guys that played, that, that's the job they did. Yeah, it was, uh, was uh, in the, well, let's say the construction trade. If they weren't an iron worker, they were a carpenter, a block layer, or things like that, you know. Yeah, uh, wasn't too many farmers on our team, <laughs> no, but we did run into a lot of them elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Minor lacrosse, I think, though, was it was relatively almost like non-existent, like on the reservation back then. My dad coached a bunch of us boys back in 1950. And we won the Pee A championship. I was 10 years old at the time. And he coached that team at when he was retiring from the game. But throughout the 50s, if I can recollect, I didn't, there was no, no minor lacrosse to play. Uh, different older fellas at the time would put a, get a bunch of guys together, Pee Wee, Bantam, maybe midget, but I don't think so. If I can remember right, they would enter tournaments in like St. Catharines, Port Dalhousie, uh, Brampton, just getting into a tournament as a, like an invitational. I think that's how, that, that's how most of us got to play prior to the 60s. I only played uh, 
I think for Mr. Bill Buckley in Hamilton, that's where I played a junior, my little bit of junior lacrosse for him and my brother. And uh, there was about half a dozen of us came from the reservation and played in Hamilton for, uh, that was junior B, I think it was, or junior A. It must have been junior A because we played against Peterborough. Yeah. And uh, after that, it just seemed like there was one, my brother and I, and maybe two out of that group went on to play when um, the first warrior team was formed, the Six Nation Warrior Team. Back then, like in 1959, was the first one formed. And as a junior player, I got to play on that team and I was a part of that. When that was initiated by Mr. You-Know-Who, Ross Paulus, and a few of his other, a few of his other lacrosse people, friends, and um, that's when the, you know, the, the lacrosse uh, game, so to speak, start to snowball, start to, you know, we start, uh, it start to evolve into uh, something that became bigger down the road as, as, as the years went by. So again, we had to leave the res to play in Hagersville, who had just built a new arena. We were the first ones to play lacrosse out of that arena in 1963. And uh, prior to that, we had played in Brantford. In the, I gotta name these arenas because that's the only way I can jog my memory is that, we played at the Elf, uh, what is Elf, not the Alfred Street, the Arctic Street Arena. We played out of the Paris Arena, the Celops Arena, which it's called today. And we played out of that, and then we finally went, to, that's where it said, we finally went to Hagersville and played out of a brand new arena. We were there for three, four, five, six, four years until we moved to Brantford. And like, uh, we were the first team that played lacrosse out of the brand new Civic Center at that time, 67. What do I think of the game played today? I gotta say, the, the rules are the defining factor to me as how it's played today as, as uh, compared to when I played, like, years ago, the 60s, the 70s, um, different rules came in, start to get uh, uh, a little bit more, like you might say, it changed the, the way you played the game or the way I played the game. Because of the way I played the game compared to the way you played the game, the rules affected you as it affected me, you know, similarly. So the rules sort of, to me, controlled the flow of the game right. through the years, year after year after. It seemed like every three or four years, somebody was come up with a brainwave, well, we better change this. Maybe we should change this. The biggest thing they changed was the face-off. Huh? And that change the whole ball game, you know, right then. I mean, they don't throw the ball up, you know, like they do a basketball, but they did put the ball between two sticks that were together. Right. And that's how we always said, that's where you define a center man from a guy that played defense all the time. Center man stood out if he could get the ball nine times out of 10. Today, <laughs> compared, fast forward to now, with their sticks this far apart and the ball in the middle, it's like who gets there first, but there is dominant players that can do that today. Right. It's right. like, that's where you, <laughs> that's where you see, oh, oh, that you ask somebody, is the hand quicker than the eye? So, in that case, the hand is quicker than the other guy because the guy that 
wins the draw. Yeah, he's got quick hands, knows how to do that. As like you just can't say, well, yeah, I'm gonna send him. I'm gonna take. I'll take the ball off that guy. No, no, no. It, now it, it, it's you. You have equal chance. And uh, like I said, you got sticks that far apart. But from box lacrosse today, as compared to box lacrosse. Today in the pro league, that's where you get that face off, what I just described. Yep. But in box lacrosse, it's a, it's a little bit of the old style. You know, some of the guys still use the old style of a, of a draw. That changed the game from what it used to be when I first started in uh, uh, junior and um, uh, the senior, senior uh, leagues. So it, it, it's, uh, when it comes down to it, that's why I said, rulings, styles of um, a face-off situation, and uh, the checking, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of ways that a person or a player checked an offensive player back then. Yeah. It's today is a lot more. He's hampered by the rule change. The defensive you, players. The defensive player is held within a certain range of things that you can do. Back then, it was like if you you were checking an offensive player and he he's either going to run over you or go around you or do whatever, you could do whatever you could do, the knowledge you had to prevent that. Now it's like <laughs> what you can do according to the rule, that guy could waltz around you, you'd have to ask somebody which side he go by me on. You know, like uh, the, the, you're prohibited with the stick yeah. to do what you really can't, could do. 10, 15 years ago, maybe longer than that, you know. So that, that, that's, uh, that's, a, that's what I see. And I, the nowadays, I, uh, I've watched NL games, and every five years, it seems like it's softening up. I don't have as much interest in it anymore as I did 10 years ago. I don't. And I hear old, the guys my age and guys a little bit younger than me say the same thing. Different yeah, different game, totally different game. Catch the ball and run. I think it, that's basically what I know. That's you know how they did it. The guys get down there, put their sticks there. The guy puts the ball down. Yeah, best man win. Whoever pulled it out. If you had, if you had, you, you, you try to do that on a cement floor or a carpet floor, yeah. and if you go out in the field on the natural turf, it's who can dig the, <laughs> dig the hole, yeah. dig the furthest hole in the ground to get the ball out. You know, like it, it, it just in there. You're twirling that stick, and it's all folded it's up good. like an old newspaper. Yeah. You know, so I, 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 I don't disagree with it, yeah. but that's what you do. So if you call it progression, if you call it uh, a system, this is how we do it. We're, you know, like if a, if a guy said, okay, he's at this school or he's at this, with this team, he said, well, this, if you're going in there, you, you, you tell him, oh, I'm a face-off man, or I'd, I'd like to take the draw, see how I can do. He says, well, we do it this way, and that's the way you're gonna do it. So it's just like, again, it's a little bit dictation. Uh, so that, again, it's, I go back to the rule, the, the rule of the face-off uh, will dictate who gets the ball. They had, a, they had several of them probably uh, when I was just, uh, we'd go to the, to the longhouse and they had a ball ground, a place where you played ball, 
And what I will remember is they did have an outdoor box, which was pretty much, by the time I was even 10 years old, it was ready to fall down. So they probably had it there for 20 years prior to. Right. Yeah, and that's where most of our guys might have played. I don't, I'm not sure of that, but that was the first outdoor box that I seen at the time, and it was pretty much on its way to demolition, so to speak. <laughs> and then we had another one back in the late 50s. It was at the agricultural grounds in Oshwegan, right in the village. They had built one there, and it sort of took a different turn because of the people that were in charge of, that had built it. We built it for out for to play outdoor lacrosse, yeah. but they start to use it for agricultural purposes, oh. so that ruined everything. And it just it, it lasted a couple of years, three years, and it, it, it just it went down. It, it, it didn't stay there long. So after that, it was well, people, other people, well, people start getting a little more. Uh, educated towards that thing and the way the, the, the way we were uh, guys were looking for places to play going away to play the different town so that's when a, a group of people got together and start the uh, well let's we need an arena like other small towns have so they start working on that that was like a within a five-year phase we had it and that's the one that Gaylord Paulus Arena yeah. to this day. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> they, yeah, there's, oh, there was, there was, so oh, there's so many that, you know, that at one time or another, it seemed like every year you, re, you, you say, well, we got this guy on that team, we got to watch this guy. You gotta go, go to another town a couple of weeks later. We got oh, they got this guy. They got it, it, this. Uh, with that question being asked to me now, that's why I said uh, there was a, there was a lot, a lot of guys and the guys. I think to answer your question, who was a guy that stood out in my mind back in, like say, I, I have to kind of categorize it like uh, this decade, that decade, and that's how we sort of picked our Hall of Fame guys back home too. Um, a guy that I played with, Willie Logan was one. Roger Smith, Buck Smith, who played in Peterborough at one time with Ross when he was up there, when they won them four consecutive man cups. Um, guys that I played against, oh heck, Bob Doby, Fergus. I'll go by the towns that we yeah. played against. Uh, um, Cy Lemon, yeah. Own Sound, right? Yeah. Martinello from Windsor. Sarnia back then, I gotta say, uh, the, um, McGaffrey, Jug McGaffrey, and uh, MacArthur, Billy MacArthur, old Billy MacArthur, like Brad's grandfather. I tell Brad that once in a while. I said, Brad, I says, how old are you getting to be? You need to tell me. I said, you're just as old as uh, one of my boys. He says, uh, why do you ask? I says, well, so this guy, that, Bill was your dad. Yes, that's my dad. Well, hell, I must have played against your grandfather. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I did, really. He played for Sarnia or Wallaceburg in that area. But St. Catharines, I got to go by, like, they had a ton of guys. You know, I played against McCready, uh, D'Amico, guys like that. Played with Ronnie Roy, Teddy Howe. Teddy Howe played for us in 67, 68 in Brownford. Um, guys from Dundas back then. A guy by the name of 
they called him Baldy Man, I forget his first name. Really, he's, that was his nickname. Along the lake shore, there was Brian Ahern. You know, that's going way back, too. That's, uh, there was a comparing St. Catharines to another team, so to speak. I would take Brampton. They were pretty equal as far as, you know, they were the lacrosse tones of the 60s and 70s, the 50s, you know. All, and, and they was, uh, like I said, they, they, they grew lacrosse players in these towns, so. But eventually, as the years went by, we started, they, they were starting to compare our, our reservation as with that sort of atmosphere. And I'm glad of that. And because through the years, uh, through the years and the recent years, I'm, I'm glad I had a, you know, a part and a helping hand in that situation to see that it, you know, it started to prosper ever since, say, 1960. The way I see it now, I, it has done well in the last 20 years. Yes. We've been up there near the top with a lot of these other towns that I just mentioned, and we've even went further than those, uh, those uh, places that I mentioned. And um, I'm, I'm really satisfied. I'm totally satisfied with the way it's progressed and the way I see it today. And the people, mainly because of people that are putting themselves back into the game after they, their playing careers are done. Even some that didn't play the game but using their smarts to be the people behind the scenes that are organizing it and uh, and, and 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 just keeping it alive, they'll they're they're well off enough to say, okay, well, you guys played the game, you refereed, or you most most of us were just played the game, and they said, okay, well, we'll try to get, you put the people on the floor and we'll help you in an organizational way to make you get somewhere that we all know where you're hidden for. We all have that, we're all focused on one ending situation and that's to go to the top and be there and stay there the best we can year after year after year. And I see that happening just because of a, a lot of uh, um, individuals that I give total credit for, for uh, keeping that spirit alive and uh, looking down at the young guy as somebody in 10 years time, he's gonna be doing the same thing over it's kind of a snowball effect with people that, they don't get away from the game. We don't get, we try not to get away from the game. If we do, you, you, when people do that, I think you don't see them in the arenas anymore. It, it is, they just want to stay away because they've put their time in, so to speak. But most of us, it's, yeah, they, yeah, we, we, we just want to progress, yep. Yes, that, the, <laughs> that's the best shot and arm we ever could get. Yes. You know, with that in the certain individual that that did that, or a couple of individuals that the inspiration that they had at the time to do that. You know, uh, years ago when we were just young fellas, there was there was no one around like that that could do that. Right. I mean, you gotta uh, I, you gotta face it. it it was uh, um, back in the day. It was it was it was a financial thing, really. That I mean, everybody has those situations where I mean, if you don't got the bucks, you go elsewhere to play or stay home and whatever. And uh, but 
things change. Like I said, things progressed, have progressed, progressed, progressed. Everything has. And, 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 and as far as we're concerned, uh, the work ethic of uh, certain individuals, the businessmen, what I say, the guys that can say, okay, you guys know the game, we know what we're doing. We're businessmen. What do you, what do you need to move, move this sport ahead? We're, we're going to help out. So right away you say, well, I kind of think I know what you're talking about, so let's do it. And that's what inspired these two individuals or three individuals, whoever, to do what you're talking about. The ILA, yes, I give the, those guys 100% uh, credit, pat on the back for whatever, and making it available to the young kids that use it, the adults that use it, the girls that use it. So it's just, it's just a good thing. It's a good thing. Compared to what we got one other, now there's talk of another one, you know, a facility that might be an ice hockey arena. So that, that, that's in the works. Another phase of uh, what they're doing back home too. Our people are starting to work together and stay that way rather than get together. You know, it's, it don't work that way. Things don't, you're not gonna go no place. Yeah, well, I, I actually retired in when I was 33. 33, yeah. I, I, after I got out of the OLA, playing in the OLA, uh, uh, at the OLA level, and then I went and played in that, what they call it, a Can-Am? Yeah. Or it, was, it changed names, ILA. Uh, when I played for three years, it was called the NALA. North American Lacrosse Association. So the final year that I, well, I played three years in that, and I think the last year I played was 73. And we won the championship back home, and that was the first one that, that we had won there in that league. So, but there was all the uh, native teams, you know, um, Ganawagi and Akwesasne, Syracuse. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we had one team from home that was in that league. So it was actually, yeah, when I, I played there and uh, like I said, I was 33 and then uh, <laughs> that was 1973, going on 1974. Cam over there, he was just a little guy. So uh, we sort of, had a, he had a lacrosse stick in his hands when he was three years old. So, you know, as the years went by, it, it showed, you know. And, and, and like I said, I, when I retired from playing, I kind of threw myself back into, I got to look at these guys, you know. He's, oh, he's about 10 or 12 years older than Cam. He had, we had to take him to Waterford, we took him to Brantford, to Hagersville, or Hamilton, to play minor lacrosse. But uh, when uh, Cam was starting to grow up, uh, just a minor lacrosse player, it, uh, that arena was being built, and he played most of his minor lacrosse right at home until he moved away and went junior A and played in St. Catharines for three years. So. But that's uh, uh, what I did between 74 to, I guess it was 82, right. and Ross and a couple other guys put a, got a franchise to play in the Senior B League against Orangeville, the Sanderson guys, and um, Gaylord was the coach. <laughs> they coaxed me to come back out. Yeah, I did go back out and play that summer. Uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, 42. Did you have fun? Oh, yeah. That's what, <laughs> that's what it was all about. <laughs> but uh, kind of like, uh, the only thing was that uh, you didn't have to get hit as hard to be hurting for three, four days. 
it was it was it was a fun it was a fun summer, but we had during those couple of couple of years we had uh, men's lacrosse like uh, uh, just a masters league whatever. I I I got I gotta say it was. Winning the Minnow Cup, 1992, when Cam was playing, and most of the boys that grew up playing minor lacrosse together were all on that team, 12 of them to be exact, that we had taken to Dave General and I, and a couple other people, had taken as a Pee Wee team to Coquitlam. Ten years prior to that, <laughs> yeah, and uh, we won the Pee Wee Championship. But those same guys, well, it was Miles General who was our captain in '92. In '82, he said he told the other team, uh, one of the team members from out there in Coquitlam, "Don't worry about it. We'll be back here in ten years, and we'll take the Menlo Cup home with us." Exactly what we did, <laughs> and there's the ring to prove it right there. That's just it. I put it on that summer, and I never taken it out maybe once or twice. So that is got to be one of my most personal, you know, kind of achievement. Use you know, having uh, something to do with those boys that grew up, and there's at least a half a dozen from that team that went on to play pro lacrosse. Yeah, I got to say that. It was the 92 Minnow Cup team. I mean, I was with the GM for a while. I was with the, I was a GM at, of the team. And uh, jump fast forward to 93 when the Chiefs got their franchise, Six Nation Chiefs. And then we went on to do the consecutive three-peat. They were kind of okay, but... They were, they were kind of mellow to, to win in that Minnow Cup. But that was the first Man Cup in 94 at the Res 2. They did, though. Oh, in between, like I said, 82 to 92, we had one Bas Bantam National Championship with those same guys. We defeated Surrey, I think it was Calgary, in Kitchener, those same guys. Immediate provincial in eighty seven. Immediate A provincial. Same guys, like right from that Pee Wee team. All the guys that got to stay together, won together. And that's I said we won a couple of provincial championships, you know, through those years. Wow. Yeah. It, it, it was great. <laughs> having uh, well, he was playing, and Corey came along later on, and uh, five years well, he's five years younger than Ham, Cammy, and uh, he did his thing too. He did his thing. He went on the good big things after that, and he started to play. The game has served me well personally, you know, on a personal basis, yeah. plus. I'm glad that I had so much, and I put some effort into some of these people that have went on ahead, and the feedback that I get from them guys now, man, they said, there was no people around like you before. How did you guys get to do, you know, like what you're doing now? I says, well, I don't know. It was just the interest, the interest in the game. That's the biggest thing. I think that's the biggest thing that keeps anybody that's involved with the game. That, that's what keeps it going. That's what keeps it going. It's a, a total interest. Uh, uh, you sacrifice a lot of, I know I did, a lot of family time with it. And then I don't get uh, any negative uh, feedback from my family from it because they're all a part of it. They're all a part of it. And I think there's other, I speak for other families within our community 
that feel the same way. That's about all I got uh, can offer, you know, more or less on an ending note. <laughs>